We didn't have many, many choices when we were young. We were just, just more or less working at home in, in our, on our own piece of land. The expected road uh, was to be a, a mother to your children and a stay-at-home mother. Oh, they were much more um, defined and much more um, confined for women. Well, being an aerostress would mean being away a lot and my parents wanted me to stay at home. I wanted to be a seamstress when I was little. When I was little, I wanted to be a farmer. When I was little, I dreamed of being an air hostess. I always wanted to be a teacher. Looking back at the 1960s, times were much more simple than they are today. The aspirations for men and women followed a much more traditional path as people lived a more spiritual and family-centric life. The values coveted by society were heavily influenced by the government and the position of Ireland as a religious state. Men provided the main source of income for the family and women were expected to run the household and look after the children. For most of the 20th century, and this still applies in the, the middle of the 20th century, uh, career opportunities and expected career paths are very much defined by traditional ideas about the family. Um, so the priority is for men to work. Uh, the idea of the traditional family, the husband works, the wife stays at home, um, and that doesn't form opportunities to a large extent. Um, women are in the workplace. You're more likely to find single women in the workplace than married women, um, but even those women who do work are often found in a relatively limited number of professions. The kind of areas where women are overrepresented would be uh, teaching um, or something like clerical work. Domestic service would be particularly prominent in, in the first half of the, the 20th century. Men are very much expected to be the ones who do the work. So in some ways there's a lot of pressure on men to work and to get employment. So on the one hand the pressure is coming from the men themselves who feel they need to fulfil that role in society as the breadwinner. But there's also pressure from the government who prioritise jobs for men. So in times of job shortages the idea is to get men into work first. Um, there are a number of areas where men uh, very much dominate work. The first is politics, of course, um, but also policing, the defence forces, the higher, uh, the upper echelons of the civil service. Um, jobs at the higher end of industry as well tend to be re re restricted for men, but that's all based around the idea that it, it's the man's role to be the breadwinner and the priority is to get the man into work. Well, I suppose our, our expected roles would be to get married, family, look after them, and which I did, I think, here fairly well. When I moved into the house I'm in mean, now, it was very lapidated, and I had seven, six children at the time, and we had to spend a lot of my time uh, doing short hours for driving a lorry and working on the house a lot of hours at night and day. In 1937, a new constitution was passed, Bunrocht Naheran. While this constitution may have been seen as a progressive piece of legislation by those both inside and outside of Ireland, it reinforced the traditional gender roles present in Irish society. With the introduction of Article 41.2.1, the state places grave importance on the role of women in the home. In particular, the state recognises that by her life within the home, the woman gives to the state a support without which the common good cannot be achieved. This article is followed up by Article 41.2.2, which explains that the state will endeavour that mothers will not be forced by economic necessity to neglect their roles within the household. The marriage bar that was introduced in 1932 reduced the agency women had of their own careers. This, combined with the new constitution, further strengthened the gender divide. 
But the expectation was always that I would marry and have children and that my job would be secondary, that it would be the second income in the household. And, uh, you know, that, that was the expectation that um, my job should be a secondary part of my life. And the nuns in the school who consider themselves very progressive and the teachers who taught me all looked to uh, create girls in their in their own mould and in the mould of I suppose almost 19th century Britain more so than anything else and um, for urban dwellers certainly um, the idea was that you would go you get an office job or you get a nice job teaching or something and then you'd um, have an easy life and you wouldn't um, you might give up for a few years and have your children then you go back just for a bit of pin money uh, if you were from a rural background uh, it was probably more grounded and a bit more practical but uh, the aim was always to get a job either teaching or nursing or in the civil service and again it would be a secondary income if you had a farm that uh, it would supplement the, the real income from the farm and that was very very hard to break out of um, and Ireland was slower in breaking out of it than other countries. I did a secretarial course over in Thurles after leaving secondary school here in Nina and I worked in a solicitor's office until I got married. Doing children's clothes, dress make children's dresses and school uniforms and I also did alterations on clothes that need shortening and repairs. There are a number of areas in which the government tried to take a direct role um, in, in employment prospects, particularly where women are concerned. Um, in the middle of the 1920s, for example, you see uh, there's originally an attempt to exempt women or to, to basically ban women from jury service. Um, eventually it becomes that women have to opt in uh, as opposed to men who are automatically eligible for jury service. Uh, in the early 1930s, uh, the Free State Government introduced a marriage bar, which means that once women get married, they have to leave civil service jobs. There are also restrictions in the civil service um, because women are debarred from taking certain examinations. Uh, in 1934, that marriage bar is extended to teachers, so uh, once female teachers get married, they have to, to, to resign their, their jobs. Um, so that very much impacts um, positions in society because you'll find you know, married women are a very, very small proportion of the workforce. I remember going to, um, I'm sure you all did them, the open days and the um, career fairs, etc. And there was one in the RDS back in 1977. And um, I remember walking around and there were two stands where I got really, really angry. It was the first time I, I realised that there was a, something that I couldn't do. I went to the... Um, uh, airline pilots and um, at the time you needed honours maths which I didn't have but that was incidental um, but the guy who was telling people about the great job of being a pilot which I didn't want to do because I knew I wanted to be a teacher but anyway that was me uh, he kept saying but you know uh, I'm really sorry but you can't do this job and I said why not well he said and he was very embarrassed uh, you have to have honours maths so I said of course what is maths no problem you have to have 2020 vision and I didn't have glasses at the time so uh, and I did have 2020 vision so that's no problem and then he said but you have to be a man. And I said, what? What do you mean? So that was a real, um, real eye-opener. And the other one then, I went to the army. And again, I didn't want to join the army, but I had a whole load of young lads uh, around myself and my friends, a whole load of girls. And they were all chatting and flirting and the rest of it. And uh, I said, well, how do I go about joining the army? And they said, well, you can't. And I said, well, why can't I join the army? Uh, you know, I'm going to do my leaving cert and why can't I? And they said, well, because you're a woman. But I nearly became an air hostess. My mother hid the letter saying I was called back for a second interview to Shannon and we just forgot about it. They had a choice of factory work, working in the factories. Um, some like so machine, being seamstress, and others worked in bachelors. They worked in players' factory. They had a choice in players' factory, cigarettes. And then there was a jam factory. 
Industrialization is important um, in the sense that it creates more jobs. And the more jobs there are, the more opportunities there are. And that often benefits people who might have been marginalized before. Um, in the 1960s, for example, when Ireland starts to industrialize in a way it hadn't done before, um, you know, women are still very much marginalized in, in the workforce. And the priority is in getting work for men. And I went back farming again then, at that stage. And that didn't work out. I joined up then with a fella with, that I used to buy my I used to buy the iron and sweaters off for the company, and he was opening a bar in Limerick and asked me to go work in Limerick, and I went to work in Limerick. That didn't work out either. There are lots of socio-economic influences that, that very clearly dictate how people work in Ireland. Um, and in some ways, limiting it to a small number is, is not ideal. But if we take, for example, education is absolutely key. Uh, in the first half of the 20th century, more people are staying in school longer than they had been in the 19th century. More women are staying in school than they had been. And that very clearly influences job prospects. Um, education, numbers of people participating in education continues to rise over the course of the century. Uh, the issue with that is that it's often the middle classes who benefit most. Um, so they're the people who can you know, get the education that allows them to achieve positions that are very highly sought after. For example, white collar jobs in the civil service, there's high demand for that kind of work among both men and women and, and the educated have a, a clear advantage there. Um, a big change in that regard is comes in 1967 um, when the government introduced free second level education uh, and that certainly increases uh, working class participation in second level education which thereby increases job prospects. It takes a little bit longer for uh, the range of people attending third level to expand, but certainly by the 1990s, when free third level education is introduced, um, that again impacts on the kind of jobs and the prospects that people have. So qualifications are, are hugely important. With joining the EU, the removal of the marriage bar and the introduction of free second and third level education, the numbers of women and men in the workforce have steadily increased. Over the years, the divide between men and women has narrowed, with women now being welcomed into traditionally male-dominated professions and more men embracing roles within the home. According to the latest census, there are three times as many women in the workforce now as there was in 1964. This is attributed not only to the legislative progression over the past 50 years, but also with the creation of jobs and opportunities that did not exist in the 60s. The roles that women undertake have changed hugely in my lifetime and the freedom to uh, work and to work in any area is you know, absolutely gigantic. I remember uh, years ago the president of the college here, Sister Angela Bulger, um, proclaiming that she was amazed that, um, and very nervous when she found that the pilot of her plane was a, was a female. Um, so that would never happen nowadays. The people would be amazed at a female bus driver. Um, I suppose people might be amazed at a female priest in the Roman Catholic Church, whether that day would ever come or not, I don't know. There are very few roles, there are very few jobs that a woman can't do. Um, by you know, virtue of the fact that she's a female. Men and women now have changed drastically over the years. They have all the more up-to-date technology now. It's, it's all technology now. It's not, uh, there's very little uh, work in, in other than technology. I think the ch they have an awful lot of choices they can do, they can end up whatever way they like. I really think it's great. But at the same time, I think they're missing out on a lot of uh, detail that older people could give them about how to survive in hard times as well as in soft times. I think there should be more factories and apprenticeships that people will have choices to be more self-sufficient in what they choose to do. It seems to work out fairly well for me. I'm on the old age pension now, and the company pension, so I'm not too badly off. You're happy out? I'm happy out. <laughs>